Fallout 4 has a lot of weapons and a lot of modifications for each of those weapons. My favorite guns in Fallout New Vegas were always rifles, so in honor of that today, we beat Fallout 4 only using the hunting rifle. The gun itself isn't found right at the start of the game, and even when you do get your hands on it, the ammo isn't very common, but if we fix those two issues, the gun itself will prove rather deadly at long range. With those points made, get on your thigh highs, and let's get ready to party. As I finish peeing in the sink while my wife stands slightly off camera, I make myself look extra pretty by selecting preset 4. When the vault tech employees stopped by my house, I named myself Adam Hunt and went with a notable 5 intelligence, 7 agility, and 5 luck. My initial thoughts going into this are simply to avoid vats as much as humanly possible and to get a lot of headshots if my poor accuracy will allow. I play with Sean again as my wife teleports behind me looking rather seductive as she leans up against the pocket door. I love pocket doors a lot. But as my lustful thoughts grab hold, a nuclear apocalypse is brought down upon us. Running towards the vault, I step on the door and watch the pretty fireworks. Oh my God! It isn't long before I get well acquainted inside of the vault and equip my cute outfit. Soon after, I feel my vision shift to blue as ice covers my vision and urethra. My wife died and I stole her wedding ring for barter and started making my way through the vault. Realizing that I can't pick up the Pip-Boy wall in combat, I end up luring them back to the cryo chamber where I manage to lock them inside before looping back to the exit. Armed with a new cute accessory, I unlock the door before the elevator returns me to the surface. I take the time to loot a few crates full of goodies before watching the ass of a stout man run into the root cellar and sanctuary where I found more food, medical supplies, and most importantly the golden bars for some early game caps. Heading towards Walden Pond, a location we previously visited to obtain the weapon at Big Jim, we snuck inside to grab the short hunting rifle off of the duffel bag in the first room. This is a great find, but you'll notice that I have no 308 ammo. Time to fix that. After having a little bit of fun experimenting with domestic violence, I traded with Trashcan Carlo for three 3-8 rounds. I can't say that's exactly the quantity that I was looking for, but it'll have to do. A little ways down the road, I say hello to Trudy and offer my services. She requests that I utilize my three bullets on some troubling raiders. One of the trio put Wolfgang down with one shot, but Simone proved a little bit more challenging due to deft evasion tactics. Trudy and her gang put them down and I was able to obtain a decent reward from my aid. Armed with an extra 12 shots from her wares, I put a point into Idiot Savant for additional experience gain. At this point, I wasn't reasonably confident that I could kill anything with 12 bolts, including myself. For this reason, I traveled south, hoping to unlock more locations for future adventures. Immediately after getting some ammo from Cricket, I wasted it on a nearby scavenger. I will argue that it wasn't a complete waste as I felt like it was rather satisfying, being able to actually kill something for once in these challenges. I am aware that this run might not be particularly difficult, but it's one that I've had a hard on now for a little while after starting Fallout 4 thanks to the modification system. Along the way to Boston Commons, I'm careful to avoid any encounters, but the ones that I do participate in, I manage to succeed with a decent amount of grace. Stumbling across to Hallucinogen Incorporated, I level up to level 3 and still a few pieces of gunner gear. For my perk at this point, I ended up going with Rifleman for obvious reasons. It isn't long before I step inside Park Street Station. I learned pretty quickly that this is a poor decision going in at level 3 when the first encounter almost kills me, but I wasn't scared off just yet. The second encounter doesn't go much better, but fortunately all the enemies line up perfectly at the bottom of the staircase, making for easy kills and even easier looting. Reasonably happy with my dent, I left with my 9 bullets in hopes of obtaining more. When I stumbled across Diamond City, I managed to pick up another two dozen rounds or so as well as sell off any goods that I didn't need like bullets of other varieties. Now with an astounding 25 bullets, I take out a few more triggermen inside before once again shoving my stick into an unprotected hole. This rather dirty encounter allows me to get inside of the vault where I waste more bullets. I found out pretty quickly that instead of using my rifle as a rifle, it's more effective as a tiny, short-range pistol. I'm hoping we can change this later when we go to modify this weapon, but until then, we'll have to make do with its shortcomings. It isn't about how long your barrel is, it's how you use it. Knowing that I don't have enough ammo to take care of the whole mob, I rush towards Dino, popping a jet as I go, and manage to put him down with my last remaining bullet. Grabbing the password from his body, I save Nick from his imprisonment. Idiot Savant allows me to gain two levels, so I put one point into Gunnut and another into Sneak. Because I used my last bullet on Dino, that does unfortunately mean that I have to rely on Nick to be able to take down the rest of the enemies in the vault. After several terrible attempts, resorting to using weapon bashing, a little bit of saves coming, and of course Kim's, Nick and I make it through just fine. I am a little bit disappointed in myself for using weapon bashing, 
but it's something that I never get to utilize in Fallout New Vegas, because it isn't in the game. Either way, it's still utilizing the weapon, even if it's the wrong end. My first plan for dealing with Skinny Malone was to completely avoid him. Unfortunately, this required me to leave Nick behind, which wasn't an option, so I just kind of wasted a little bit of time there. My second attempt, I tried to appeal to Darla with my non-existent charm. She didn't like that idea, so I had to resort to dying multiple times before hitting up Skinny Malone for the same offer. But the rather handsome chap took me up on the deal, and I was able to escape with Nick while possessing an intact pussy. He suggested that we meet back up at Diamond City, so I headed over and purchased some more ammo. In addition, utilizing Gunnut allowed me to upgrade my rifle to have a scope and a better stock. We're still in the market for more rounds, but hopefully this will allow me to have better accuracy with my shots. While in town, I sit with Nick, and we come to the conclusion that we should look into a man named Kellogg for the disappearance of Sean. My first stop sees me taking an elevator up to see the mayor. He greets me with his ass as I expected, and I plunder it so I can use my lockpicking lore skills to bust inside of Kellogg's abode. Once inside, I looted the place for as many supplies as I could fit in my prison wallet. Nick then suggests that we use Dogmeat to guide us to Fort Higgin, the location of Kellogg himself. Deciding I know more than that of the nose of a dog, I wander the Commonwealth to find the man that I am looking for. By wonder, I mean that I just head straight there. I square off against several turrets and manage to get a few good sneak attacks. They weren't what scared me, however. Getting to the front door, two ragstads stared at me menacingly. I made a good call and backed down, leaving them to their posts. I kill a few more turrets up on the roof and contemplate stepping inside, but ultimately, you and I both know that I can't take down all the sense inside without more experience, ammo, and modifications to my gun. With those items taken care of, I dismiss dogmates and headed inside. Being in tight quarters is obviously not great for the long range of the hunting rifle, but I quickly found a strategy of being able to shoot the target once before hitting them with the bayonet. I won't lie, this did get really sloppy, but as you know, I like things a little bit sloppy. I went through Fort Higgin carefully, making sure that I was able to take down my targets without getting too greedy with the kills. I had a lot of fun using the hunting rifle now that I had its associated perks and wasn't just a melee build. This weapon can easily carry a person to the end of the game with the right build, but not even halfway through the run, I've already learned quite a lot about how the game functions, outside what I had already learned from our melee run. I'm looking forward to doing some of these easier challenges, but of course, you guys are always welcome to leave your suggestions in the comments below. My first attempt at Kellogg did not go very well when he managed to throw a fragmentation grenade in my direction, but the second time went much better when I almost killed him with one shot from a sneak attack. With Fort Higgin complete, I leave through the roof and completely avoid the Brotherhood of Steel. I return to Diamond City to talk to Arturo to sell him some of my goods, as well as Sanctuary to drop off all the junk that I have been carrying around for an extended period of time. Nick is pleased but saddened by the fact that I don't have my son, so he gives me the suggestion of going to see Dr. Amari. Beginning the journey to Good Neighbor, I begin cleaning up the Commonwealth. After I was content with my exploration, I ran for my life from a death call and some vicious dogs to get inside the town of Good Neighbor. Cleo sells me some ammo, I meet Dr. Amari, and it isn't long before I sit inside of the tube from Memory Lane. As a result, we learn about teleportation and Virgil. Needing to travel through the glowing sea, I try to avoid all the targets that I can. Obviously, I'm still not well equipped to deal with anything stronger than the average raider, so most of the combat offered in this portion of the map is off the table. Outside of avoiding enemies and utilizing radiation reduction from the form of Radex, there isn't a whole lot of rational thinking or much to comment on. I will say that I did come across a really cool looking death call at one point and I did want to mate with it. I thought better. Stepping inside of a cute cave, Virgil and I have tea and chat about his days in the institute. With Virgil, I feel like a grandkid again, listening to my grandpa's stories of war. Once armed with the location of the courser, I start murdering all the gunners inside.
Unfortunately, when I got to the top, I had ran out of bullets and needed to do my rounds again at the helpful vendors. Crash Can Carla, Trudy, Cleo, and Arturo sold me a combined amount of 173 rounds. With the help of a stealth boy and a few Kims, I was able to put down the invisible foe, kill a few disarmed gunners, and head out on the roof where I enjoyed taking out a few raiders. After fast traveling back to Good Neighbor, I head over to the memory den to have the Courser chip analyzed. Because Dr. Amari can't decode the chip, we have to go and find the railroad. After getting blasted by a soup meat with a missile launcher, I race around to find an entrance to the Old North Church. Stepping inside, there are ghouls who want to talk to me about my car's extended warranty. My patented bayonet shot attack does rather well in these tight and close spaces, and isn't long before I get to the railroad's main entrance. Entering the code, I spam through the five minutes of dialogue. Given that I sided with the Brotherhood in the last playthrough before swapping over to the Minutemen because the Steel Men were mean to me, I had hoped that the Railroad would be a better alternative. I let Tinker Tom tinker around my insides. Desdemona flirts with me aggressively. I fight for my life through a loading screen that takes longer than the most explosive diarrhea that I've ever had, and return to Virgil, aka Big Daddy. He tells me that I need to talk to one of the Big Three, those being the Railroad, the Brotherhood of Steel, or the Minutemen. Deciding that I'd at least like to give the railroad a shot, I talk with Deacon. I agreed to do whatever he signed me up for, including digging holes for glory, and leave the church, facing yet another 5 minute loading screen for my sins. Deacon proves to be a man after my own heart, for two reasons. Not only does he like to play dress up, but he also likes to use a hunting rifle. He's a 10, but I have to follow behind him, making him a 1. This leads me to Ricky Dalton, one of the best personalities that I've come across in the entire game. Something about his mustache and his gruff tone make me quiver with excitement. Getting done with him in more ways than one, I learn that the situation with the old institute base is rather complicated and involves some various explosives. This has been the only dialogue in the entire game that I haven't felt like skipping past, and now I feel big-brained that I know what's going on. Stepping into the secret tunnel and getting the door unlocked, I go on a killing spree consisting of a bunch of scents. Getting to the bank vault with Deacon and having 4 points to spend on the skill tree, I opt for Sneak, Gun Nut Rank 2, and 2 ranks of Scrounger. After grabbing anything that isn't nailed down, I kill a few more scents while leaving through the front entrance, which is the opposite of what I thought we were going to do, to try to avoid the numerous enemies and turrets posted outside. Desdemona welcomes me into the railroad and I choose the name Whisper as my secret agent name. Just like in the bedroom, you won't hear me coming. I give Carrington his secret device, but he comes off kind of rough. Everybody else is really enjoyable, however. Pam is quite humorous and enjoyable to talk to, and Gloria is a little bit flirtatious, which I appreciate. I especially like it when multiple characters are talking to me at the same time, because it actually feels like I'm being loved, something that I haven't obtained for years. Now that I'm a part of the railroad, I opt to purchase the Tinker Tom special, so that I could have a silencer before obtaining Gun Nut. This is a huge jump of potential, as now I can remain and sneak much longer, allowing me to do more damage. Heading across the bridge outside to get to the dead drop, I play with a P.O. box a little bit and head into Bunker Hill. Old Man Stockton is the man that I needed to talk to, so I got to know him a little bit and dispatched a few folks on the way over the rendezvous. Mr. Stockton shows up once again, this time with H2, a sense the railroad is trying to protect. Another agent by the name of High Riser presents us to yet another walking situation where we have to follow somebody around for an extended period of time. Fortunately, he is super chill and lives in a place with the name of my favorite pencil. Returning to Dr. Carrington, I level up to level 15 and get a few goodies for my efforts. I then relay my need for transportation to the Institute and find that my dear thick Sturges is replaced with Tinker or Tom. He nerds out a little bit and sends me over to Pam who informs me about Mercer Station, a new settlement that should have enough space for the teleporter. Buying some supplies for both killing things as well as getting into the Institute, I start building the device at Sanctuary. I would go and unlock Mercer Station, but all my supplies are already at Sanctuary and I'm sure that it is just another settlement and not anything more dramatic. After constructing the teleporter, Desdemona gave me permission to penetrate the Institute. Now at level 17, thanks to Idiot Savant, I pick up the Ninja Perk and Lone Wanderer. Once inside the Institute, I start looking at terminals and load the network scanner. After taking the elevator down, I take another elevator back up and see my boy Sean while literally stealing everything that isn't nailed down. Of course, Sean is not Sean and is actually a robot. The real daddy is the daddy we came on along the way. Sean introduces himself as father even though I am his father and I read the message from the Patriot telling me to meet immediately. 
He gives me a wonderful spiel about doing what is right for sense, but I'm too busy stealing all the aluminum that I can get my hands on. Getting back on track, Liam gives me a quest to find some security codes to allow multiple robots to escape. Father, of course, sends me to meet up with the courser who is on a mission to retrieve a particular scent. Because we are siding with the railroad, I return to Desdemona and fill her in on the situation. Pam tells me where I can find the password for the Patriot, but Tom ended up giving me Mila, some sort of device that he once placed on Lexington's Corvega assembly plant. Setting off in the middle of the night, I'm sure to follow through with each of my shots. After a ton of murder, I pick up the repair bobblehead that I'll never use considering the fact that we don't use power armor and place Mila on a very precarious looking board. Before heading back to headquarters, I still needed to obtain the Code Defender password. As a result, I headed over to Cambridge Polyamor Labs and talked to Molly. I get to work drinking some water before introducing the feral ghouls inside to my bullets. After remembering that I needed to play scientist for a little bit, I collect the materials and plug them into the machine. I found that the isotope control room is in C5, allowing me to get inside, kill the glowing ghoul, and grab the isotope. Then I head back over to construct the unique power armor chest piece. Originally we came here for the railroad, but all that entailed was downloading the password off of a terminal, which we already did when interacting with the terminal upstairs. Molly is extra pleased by this fact, so she introduces me to the director, who happens to have been turned into a feral ghoul. It's nice to have the final conclusion to this quest, but it is unfortunately rather sad, like Fallout always seems to be. Talking with Tinker Tom back at the railroad HQ and letting him know that I dropped off Mila a little while ago. He is impressed, and I learned that it is not a unique quest, but a repeatable one as he gives me another Mila. I took it, but ultimately I decided to go talk to Desdemona, before talking with Z1 to encourage a rebellion of sorts. He tells me to kill a few guards, and me being the stealth hitman that I am, I intended to kill them all without being seen. Unfortunately, they are all standing right next to one another, making that a little bit tricky. Regardless, I come out on top and manage to put them all down before heading back to the elevator and talking with Z1. After all that rigmarole, I came to find out that I just needed to continue working for Father, regardless, and act as though I didn't just try to betray him. Deciding that I really didn't have many other options, I start heading towards the Raider encampment to meet up with X688 and start hunting. After recalling the scent, I return to Father to talk about a plan to foil the Railroad's plan, return to the Railroad's HQ again to spoil Father's plan of spoiling the Railroad's plan, and heading over to Bunker Hill to initiate all the plans that we have planned. The first step, of course, is to meet up with the Corsair who is attacking Bunker Hill before I break inside over a wonderfully placed bus. Deciding here inside of this large room that it is as good a spot as any to take care of the Corsair, I work with a few heavies to take them down. Unsurprisingly enough, it only takes one shot, allowing me to secure all the four cents by adding them to my personal dungeon. Once outside, I see that I have the option of talking with Father at the CIT ruins, so I head over through a super mutant infested building to get to him. On the way, I do obtain something rather interesting. I ended up finding a hunting rifle with a defiant effect, which essentially doubles the damage of one shot per magazine. When used appropriately, this could end up drastically changing the way that I engage in combat. Regardless, I am able to talk with Father, do a little bit of weapon modifications with two separate rifles, including the Tinker Tom Special and the Defiant Sniper Rifle that we just picked up, and realize that the Railroad ending is just the Institute ending with more steps. 
relaying out of the Institute and making the Brotherhood of Steel my permanent enemies. I learned that they were pretty beefy boys when I struggled to take down one of their knights. According to most sources, the hunting rifle is a great weapon for the middle of the game, but now towards the end of our time here in the Commonwealth, the weapon appears to be lacking in terms of damage. While traveling down the elevator, I opt to stay hidden and save my ammo for the trials ahead. Ali, in the meantime, gets beaten up multiple times. I restore the power to the elevator, allowing me to skip a little bit of combat, get a few headshots, and head down yet another elevator. There is quite a lot of verticality in Fallout 4, but if I don't want to be put in the ground six feet under, I need to ensure that I can hack the terminal to prevent the assaultrons from writing my obituary. Heading inside the irradiated area with the help of a hazmat suit, I grab the agitator and beeline for the exit. Unfortunately, my preparation tactic did not work very effectively and I had to shut down the Assaultrons for the second time. It is a particularly scary sight, watching them stare menacingly at your supple body. What's even scarier is not being able to get to the exit as you watch as your coworker is being brutally beaten by a sentry bot. Why this particular section requires you to kill everything is completely confusing, but I bite the bullet and face the sentry bot. All in all, it just took a lot of bullets and before long I was able to return to the Institute and drop off the agitator. Talking with Father again, I head over to some structures near Grey Garden and deal with several gunners. Once inside, I try to recruit somebody into the Institute, but ultimately they have to utilize the synth to obtain the target. On the bright side though, I did get Idiot Savant to trigger on this quest, so I ended up getting almost two whole levels out of what equates to five or six bullets. I grabbed a point at a rifleman and two points in a cap collector to hopefully be able to purchase more ammo before talking with Father for what feels like the 15th time. I record this speech and decide to talk to Desdemona to find out that there's another quest available at Ticonderoga. Desdemona is pleased with my ability to kill the coursers. I buy some more ammo and head over to the radio shack to spread my message to the world. Now knowing that there's a clear LED indicator, this takes significantly less time than what it has in the past. Returning to Father, you're probably noticing a common theme. I activate the reactor so that the Institute can have more power. They asked me how well I understood theoretical physics. I said that I had a theoretical degree in physics. They said welcome aboard. Afterwards, I meet with Z113 and he tells me that the railroad is in immediate danger due to the Brotherhood of Steel, so I rushed over to warn Desdemona. Fortunately, I'm just in time and I take out the Brotherhood party with relative ease. Talking with Desdemona after the fact, she tells me that I am to steal a vertebrate so that they can commit Operation Red Glare, the destruction of the Brotherhood's blimp. I do things a little bit backwards and clear out most of the hostiles before grabbing Tinker Tom and heading inside to begin in an insane assault on the Brotherhood. After planting the bombs and blowing up the Pridwin, I return to Desdemona to let her know of the good news. She tells me that we are ready for the final assault on the Institute. As I ride the elevator towards the relay room for one last blast, I can't help but appreciate the nature of the railroad ending. The slaughter of one kind to save another.